Let's stand and praise God.
And before we are cleaned up, you have granted us your grace and mercy. And we are continuing to be a work in progress. And we praise you that you are willing to reveal yourself to us and, and to allow us to come into your presence. And especially this morning as your children gather together, that we can worship you as one. And it adds such a new dimension to our worship. May you be blessed this morning. And may your spirit rest on us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Some great pictures there. I like that last one. I think you all did. I noticed their ears match. <laughs> I'm funny that way, I guess. <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, Labor Day. My message is not about Labor Day, but I do pray that you all have a safe 
rest of the weekend and that your travel is good. Your family visits are fine and, and that uh, you were able to, to celebrate. I know we used to have uh, Labor Day picnics uh, for work when, and uh, for different companies, sometimes at Coney Island, sometimes at Americana. So, uh, you know, those are important milestones that you celebrate another year where you are and, and the employment that you've had. I uh, wish more people would enjoy the employment they have. Uh, wish more people would have employment. <laughs> so that's another story. Celebrate Labor Day. I don't know about you all, but where I grew up, there wasn't a whole lot of discussion about politics or religion. In fact, I think I remember it being said that you, you just shouldn't talk about religion or politics in, comp in, a, in a polite company. So I couldn't tell you for sure who my parents voted for. And I didn't know if, if, as a family, if we were Democrats or Republicans, or if we were independents. We did go to church, but we weren't members of the church. I guess we were members of the, the universal church, the church at large, uh, but not the local church. And some people do that. Um, as they say, membership has benefits. I don't know what that says about our family of not being joiners. They had very strong beliefs, I'm sure, but, uh, but they never vocalized it as much as maybe I do. I only remember a few of our extended family members who spoke about Jesus and religion and church. Uh, maybe they were more religious than we were. Maybe it was more freely spoken of in, in their congregations, their fellowship. Um, maybe they didn't care. They just talked about it and let people <laughs> deal with it. Who knows the way of the heart? Only God and the shadow knows. Well, only God knows. The shadow was a radio show, so it wasn't real. <laughs> so I have. I've tried to express my beliefs pretty plainly to our kids and our grandkids and, and even to other people's kids, nephews and nieces and neighbor kids, when I have the opportunity to do it in a kind and loving way to say, you know, you need to think about things as you make decisions in life. I think we do a disservice if we don't teach these fundamental concepts to our children. How will they know what's right or wrong if it's not foundational, if it's not in their DNA? These parents that say, well, I don't want to force religion on my children. I'll, I'll let them choose for themselves what to believe or not. And that, to me, that, that's ridiculous. Would you let them choose if Tide Pods were good to eat or not? What about obeying traffic laws or crossing the street? Just, just let them decide whether they look both ways when they're going to cross a road? I, I don't think so. We, we instruct our kids to keep them safe, to, to give them the best information that we have to live their life. But that's the way it is. I think so many people are confused themselves about God and, and Jesus that they sometimes don't pass on their faith. And I think the reason, maybe, is that they have not sat under a biblically-based church or, or been in a Bible study to get their own thoughts together to, to form what they believe about Jesus and God. They haven't laid the groundwork they need to be able to stand on a faith that, that's real. They think they don't know enough, so they just kind of let the professionals the pastors and the Sunday school teachers teach their kids about faith. And I think that's uh, a problem in being parents and instructing our children. Parents need to pass on their belief to Jesus, and in Jesus. A belief that's lived out day to day and moment by moment. It's a, a faith that they can see in you, but they need to hear it also. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, let us be strong in what we believe in you. And let us nurture our children, teach them in the way that they should go. Because we know that you don't have any grandchildren. It is only those who have given their hearts and their love to you that are your children. And we can't force it 
on anyone else, but we need to be able to explain it, the reason why we believe. Allow your words to speak to us today. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we said last Sunday, Jesus is in his final days walking as a man on this earth. And for the Apostle John, writing in this gospel, the public ministry of Jesus is coming to an end. Jesus will make one last attempt to convince the crowd to believe what he has told them. And then after that, he's done. No more. Even after Jesus had done all these miraculous signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet. Lord, who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this reason, they could not believe because, as Isaiah says elsewhere, he has blinded their eyes and deadened their hearts so they can neither see with their eyes nor understand with their hearts nor turn, and I would heal them. Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him. Jesus has done all he can do to convince these people that he is actually God incarnate, God in the flesh. He's healed the lame. He's made the blind to see. He's cast out demons of possessed people. He's even raised the dead. And yet there are still so many who just will not believe. Sure, he's got a, a decent amount of people who are, uh, have accepted him, but, but for Jesus, you know, there isn't any room for failure. He truly wants everyone to believe in him and the coming kingdom of God. You've heard of Isaiah the prophet, I'm sure. You can find his book if you open up the, the, your Bible. It's in the Old Testament, and probably your Bible will be right about the middle of your Bible. Isaiah lived in a time of prosperity, and, but also religious hypocrisy, of, of, of upheaval and unbelief. Isaiah had a ministry as a prophet that lasted about 40 years. God called Isaiah out of common people who were, were of unclean lips. And Isaiah is, is actually scared to death because he sees the glory of God and confesses that he too is a man of unclean lips. According to some commentators, the glory of God that he saw could have been actually Jesus Christ. So what did Isaiah mean by saying unclean lips? I mean, that they all spoke and said things that were filthy and crude and evil? Yeah, they did, and more. They were sinful people. They, they sinned against God. And when Isaiah saw the glory of God, he thought he was going to, to meet his end. And that's probably putting it mildly. He trembled in fear. The, the only way that Isaiah, Isaiah could be made fit by, was to have a messenger of God, an angel, sent by God to go pick up a coal in the temple on the offering on the altar and then touch that coal to the lips of Isaiah. This purified not only his lips, but Isaiah's heart. In the Gospel of Matthew and Mark, when the disciples are eating food and grains of wheat, the Pharisees complained to Jesus in front of the crowd, I think just to belittle Jesus, but they told Jesus that his disciples are doing this with unclean or unwashed hands, trying to put Jesus on the spot. This is what Jesus told the crowd in chapter 7 of Mark. He went on, What comes out of a man is what makes him unclean. For from within, out of man's hearts, comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and make a man unclean. It's not what's outside. This is what Isaiah was dealing with. Not unclean lips, but it was impure hearts. Let me put those verses back up that we started with. Do you think that God is blinding people to himself? Or that he, he has hardened their hearts? That he has callous, put a callous on their hearts against anything that God would do? Or maybe the people have set their defenses up against anything that God 
does, that they refuse to see or hear what he's actually doing in their midst. It's kind of like, well, they have this mindset that there can't be a God, and the more a person tries to witness and tell him about Jesus and about God, the more they, those people put up their defenses. They've so made up their minds against him that they feel like their whole world would collapse if they give in to the truth, and that's the truth with a capital T. They've argued against God so much that they feel like they would be hypocrites if they gave an inch on his reality. You know what that really is? That's Satan lying and deceiving people about the love and grace that God offers us through his son, Jesus. These people think that they would lose their place of power. It might be a Today, it might be a professorship or a political position, even a place in a corporation or a media. Can you imagine what would happen if, if a college professor who claims the environment as the only place to worship would come to the realization that there was and is a creator? They could lose their place on any committee or focus group within the college. Same with a politician. If they acknowledge the creator of all living things and that all humans have worth, even babies, then the people at Planned Parenthood won't give to their camp re-election campaign. And a pol politician be passed over for maybe uh, important leadership in the House or Senate. And then we have the media. They, if they truly believed in God and his word, then they would have to rethink the, the dribble that they produce that promotes any type of immoral behavior on TV or in the movies. The songwriters, they, they, wouldn't be able to, they wouldn't be as derogatory if they were believers. They wouldn't be as derogatory towards women if they followed Jesus. They would no longer belong or support gangs or drugs. So all these people, they harden their hearts to God. But not, but not everyone has been deceived. Some are actually believers. And yet at the same time, many, even among the leaders, believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they would not confess their faith for fear they would be put out of the synagogue. For they love praise from men more than praise from God. It might be what we call a shallow faith, a, a, a head knowledge. It's a belief that has no heart. So you wonder about these people in leadership. How deep is their faith? They feared man more than God and would rather have men praise him than God. Here's the rub. Is there any less true to today? It's still true. Many people don't want to be found out to be a Christian in public. It's like you're a terrorist anymore especially if you're a fundamental conservative Christian. You, you just can't be trusted. Some people think a conservative Christian is too judgmental of anyone and everyone, that they don't like gays or illegal immigrants, and that's furthest from the truth because they know that Jesus loves everyone, and so do they. The college or company that they work for thinks that all Christians walk in lockstep with each other. To them, being a conservative Christian is equal to being a radical Islamist or worse, some kind of right-winger or skinhead. That's not true. A conservative Christian should be living in a relationship with Jesus and walking in the Word of God first. That should be visible to everyone. And then making decisions and life choices based on God's Word. What is it they say? It, they have a faith that's an inch deep and a mile wide. We may not realize how deep our belief or faith is until we get called out on it. Would we be willing to stand for Jesus in a work environment that condemns him and, and his teachings? Could we walk away from that secure job with its health benefits, 401K and a vacation days if we have to deny that we are Christians? We may never be put in that situation ever. But listen, consider what you would do if you were in Afghanistan or Iraq and told to deny Jesus and praise Allah, or you and your family will be shot in the head, children first. What would you do? Now, I really do pray that we never have to face that decision, but there are truly people that have to face that decision on a daily basis all over the world. 
These leaders like Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea were well-respected men in Jerusalem, yet they weren't willing to say they were followers or that they even knew Jesus because they were afraid they'd be put out of the Sanhedrin, their leadership. So belief for them may only be head knowledge. They had that. They, they knew that Jesus was special, but they had not gone the next step, the next step that was needed to place their whole trust, their faith in Jesus, to humble themselves and call him Lord. Then Jesus cried out, when a man believes in me, he does not believe in me only, but in the one who sent me. When he looks at me, he sees the one who sent me. I have come into the world as light so that no one who believes me in me should stay in darkness. Let me explain this crying out that Jesus did. We think of it as just shouting, but it was more than that. Jesus was yelling. He was trying to get his voice heard above the, the people, but also he was pleading. He was pleading with these people. This will be the last time that he'll speak with them before he's arrested and crucified. This is their last hope. He's pleading with these people to look at him, really look at him. He says, if you look at me, you will be looking through me to God. He is the one. The, he's the one who sent me. You have to believe. Put your trust in me. It's, this, it's the same as putting your trust in God. This is your last chance. Open your eyes and see. Don't let the darkness surround you. You have seen with your eyes now. See with your heart. Jesus is pleading for their lives, their very souls. He doesn't want to be rejected. These are the last words John records of Jesus speaking to these people. And he's pleading with them to, to have a deep and profound belief and faith in him. When I was working in my last days, I was being laid off at Multicolor. There was a, a man I truly loved, and a lot of people I love, but this man was just on my heart so much. And I knew I had to talk to him specifically before I didn't see him anymore. He was a good man, but I also knew how his lifestyle was. I had two young boys, and his wife worked there too. But I could see that he had a chance to turn his life around and follow Jesus if he just opened his heart a little bit. So some of my last words to him were actually, I was actually pleading with him to go to church, to get his boys in church, get his family in church, to be a man of God and accept Jesus into his heart. That was my deepest desire for him, my last words to him. And I know I said it with tears in my eyes. I couldn't help it. But that's how profound I thought the message was that he needed to hear. I can see that Jesus is pleading and crying out to these people with tears in his eyes. It's like they're missing the last chance for a lifeboat. He has it. And they're rejecting his offer. Jesus continues pleading with them. As for the person who hears my words but does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world but to save it. And we know that also from John 3.16. There's a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. That very word which I spoke will condemn him at the last day. For I did not speak of my own accord, but the Father who sent me leads to eternal life. So whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. So we tend to think of Jesus on the throne and judging the world at the end of time. But Jesus says the words that he speaks, what he has said will be what judges all people. If a person has heard the words or read the words or they've listened to the words in a Bible study or a message, if they heard them and they rejected them, by rejecting them, they're acting on those words. They have turned a deaf ear to them, and their actions to those words is what will judge them. Their acceptance of, or rejection of Jesus is what will be there at the end of time. Jesus is only telling us what God has said for him to say. God himself is offering 
eternal life through the words of his son, Jesus. And Jesus wants them to know this. Eternal life. This isn't a coal from an altar that touches our lips to make us clean. This is a deep belief that Jesus came to place himself on the altar, the final sacrifice and offering, so that when we believe on him totally, all in, then we'll be given that gift of eternal life. And that, that folks, is forever and ever. And that's a good thing. So that leaves me with this question. How deep is our belief or faith? Don and I were talking about the ladies' Bible study she leads. And they're in 2 Kings this week, or last week. They were in a part where Prophet Elijah is having a spiritual battle with King Ahab's uh, prophets of Baal. There were 450 of them. You probably know that story, but a summary would be that they were going to have a contest between which God was greater, Elijah's God, Jehovah, or Baal. So they put wood and a bull on an altar, and Elijah tells the, the Baal prophets, you go first. Go ahead. We'll see what happens. So all the 450 of them go crazy, maybe even a whirling dervish type of thing, incantations. They do everything they can for hours and hours and hours, and nothing happens. There's even some trash talk from Elijah if you want to read the story. And then it's Elijah's turn. So he has some of the servants say, pour the water on the ox and on the, the wood, totally drench it. And then he had him do it again. And then he had him do it a third time. It was totally soaked. And then Elijah prays to God that, that he would reveal that Jehovah, God, is the God of the people of Israel. And God answers Elijah by by sending fire that burns up the ox on the altar and all the wood and dries up every bit of water that was around. And the people fall down and they say, the Lord, he is God. And Elijah, he has all the false prophets of Baal killed. Now you would think that King Ahab would have learned a lesson from this and gotten the message. But you read a few chapters later, King Ahab is, is seeking advice from some 400 prophets of Baal. He's had more people put in positions. Well, Ahab saw what happened on Mount Carmel, and yet he had no belief in God? <laughs> Why is that? Just like what I was saying earlier, people have their minds set and their hearts hardened to the truth of God. They can see him in their midst, and yet they deny it. Did God do that to them, or... Or have they done it to themselves? Are they so ingrained that they cannot open their eyes? They can see, they can read what God has done, yet they ignore it and make the decision to follow false gods. That's what Jesus is dealing with in this passage. It may not be that God has blinded the people or hardened their hearts. These people can't bring themselves to change their minds. We have it today. People worship the environment, a Sophia, a Satan, or nothing at all, which is something else. We can see the creative ability of God. We can look all around us. We can read the miracles in the Bible of Jesus and the testimony that was given by others of how he has impacted their lives, and yet those who deny Jesus tend to go on their merry way. Ignoring what is plain to their senses. senses. There, there are more fact proofs in the Bible than there are on Iliad and the Odyssey, on Caesar. If you get into it and dig into it, there's more testimony on the scriptures and Jesus than many things that people take for granted that happened back 2,000 or more years ago. So don't be like them. Dig down. Engage, study, meditate on God's word. If you ever, if you ever come to a crisis situation, you need to be prepared in advance to have the foundation and faith in Jesus already there that will sustain you. Because you may not get a second chance to go back and review. 
These Christians in China and Afghanistan and the Middle East, they, they already know who has given them eternal life. They have accepted him as Jesus, as their Lord. And I won't say all of them will be strong, but many won't deny him when the sword comes for their necks. We need to strengthen our faith, our beliefs, deepen them. And in doing so, our faith will continue to grow in the process. We, we can't just have a head knowledge. We have to make that jump to our heart. We need that heart knowledge that lives in us, that our beliefs will multiply and build up our faith. Our faith is a deeper belief of knowing the truth and allowing Jesus to be in control of how we interact with this world. So we need to dig deep. And when you do, you will find the truth. When we take the elements today, I want you to remind yourself of the total sacrifice Jesus made for you. He did it for the whole world, but you have to realize he did it specifically for you. That's how much he loves you. And if he loves you that much, then how much do you love him? Let's pray. Jesus says, we praise you for who you are and what you have done for us. We know that we fail sometimes in our walk. In this, we ask for your forgiveness. We ask that your spirit would be in our midst and that through these elements, you will deepen our belief in what you have done for us on the cross. Remind us again and again and again of your love for us and strengthen us in our love for you. May you be blessed this morning by your people who remember that sacrifice. It's in your name we pray. Amen. When Jesus was in the upper room, he took the bread and he broke it and he blessed it and he said, this is my body given for you. Whenever you eat of this, do it in remembrance of me. And later in the meal, he took the cup. And he says, with this cup, I make a new covenant with you. This is my blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Whenever you drink of this, do this in remembrance of me. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you had a plan for us to redeem us back to you. And that is your son, Jesus Christ. And as Jesus would plead with all those non-believers, he is offering eternal life. We thank you. And we can never thank you enough. We praise you for who you are and we, we pray that you will continue to fill us with your spirit and build us up each and every day. It was your sacrifice that gives us that promise of eternal life. And we cannot say thank you enough. Pray this in Jesus' name.